Let's take out our Bibles and learn together. One of the most frequent type of questions that we receive has to do with marriage. And we're going to be looking at a passage of scripture over the next three or four weeks that deals with things related to marriage. So with that said, take out your Bible and look with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 7. The book of 1 Corinthians and chapter 7. Now, Paul, we're going to see, is responding. Apparently, this congregation, they wrote to Paul because they too had questions in regard to this relationship between a man and a woman. Now, remember, Corinthians, we're talking about a group of people who were known for immorality, a very unholy place, immoral. And therefore, Paul has told them repeatedly that they have been sanctified, that they have a call to manifest the character of Messiah, to live not according to how society thinks, but according to the truth of God. And that should also affect that sacred relationship between a man and a woman in a covenant known as marriage. So look with me to verse 1. We see undeniably that the motivation for what Paul's going to be saying in this chapter comes from their questions to him. Look at verse 1. And concerning what you wrote to me. So this is obvious. Paul is responding to, as it says here, what you, meaning the Corinthians, wrote to him. And notice the first thing they say. Good for a man, a woman, not to touch. Now I translated that according to the order and the literalness of the Greek text. Look at it again. It says, good for a man, a woman, not to touch. Now, this goes along with some of the false teaching, false teaching that uh, went throughout different communities, different cultures, that it was more holy for an individual not to be married, not to engage in this marital covenant. Now, in first, we see something. When we go back to the Torah, and for Paul, the Torah is always foundational. Not for salvation, but certainly for this concept of sanctification. How do we live according to the purposes of God? How do we develop the right mindset? How do we understand what is righteousness and what is unrighteousness? And the answer is, we look to the law of God, the commandments of God. And when studying these commandments, we begin to understand the mindset of God. What he says is right and what he says is wrong. We can, can develop a character understanding, meaning understanding the character of God through the expectations of God. Those positive and negative expectations, what he wants from us and what he does not want from us. So here there's a thought outside the context of the Torah. The Torah says be fruitful and multiply. The Torah says it is not good for a man to be alone. So this first question comes certainly not from a Torah perspective, but we need to be careful. We also need to realize that Paul is going to be speaking about something as a specific or unique gift. Also, we need to realize that Paul, along with most of the disciples and apostles, they expected Messiah's return to be much sooner. Now, in one sense, that's a good thing, and it's not an error, in the sense that we should be expecting Messiah each and every generation because the signs for Messiah can come about within a generation. 
So looking for him, expecting him now in our generation is not an error. It is not a mistake. It is not uh, incorrect. Rather, we should have an expectation and live as though we will see the events bringing about Messiah's return, that is, that blessed hope gathering us up. So Paul made a comment based upon that fact, and I'll talk more about that in a moment. Also, we need to know something else. Most scholars see this epistle to 1 Corinthians early in the 50s. So that's less than 20 years until what? The destruction of the temple. Jerusalem also being destroyed and the people going into what's called that Roman exile, the longest, the most severe exile. And in light of that, that also brought some statements from Paul knowing prophetically about this terrible time of persecution that was going to be placed upon the Jewish people in Israel. So look again. He says, is it good for a man not to touch a woman? Well, notice verse 2. He writes, but on account of sexual immorality. The, the supposition here is this. If a man, and we're going to see what Paul writes, there is very strong equality between a man and a woman. What God says to a man, he also says to a woman. So he writes, but because of sexual immorality, from both standpoints, whether it be a man or a woman, he says, because of sexual immorality, let each one his own wife have and also let each one, and this is in the feminine, so it's each woman, let her have her own man. Now, in Greek, the word for woman can also be understood as wife. Likewise, the word for man can also be understood as husband in the biblical text. So he writes here, let every man have his own wife and let every woman have her own husband. Two things can be stated. First of all, one man, one woman. Very important. Not multiple partners. But as the Torah says, a man should leave his parents and cling to his wife, one wife, one woman. Likewise, a woman, only one man. And the presupposition here is because of sexual immorality. That is to say that human beings, we need that intimacy, that contact between a spouse. So Paul acknowledges that and says it's necessary, but he's going to make one exception. And this is very important that we come across this, and we will in a few moments. Look now to verse 3. He speaks about the body. And he's going to tell us that we have obligations, physical and spiritual obligations. Now, we're going to be dealing with this, this intimacy between a husband and a wife. And notice that Paul says that it's important. He's speaking about, is it good for a man not to touch a woman, not having this type of, of relationship? This type of activity between a, a partner, a spouse, by a covenantal marriage. And he says here, for a woman, or to a woman, literally to a woman, a man should render his, his obligation, literally it says, the obligation of and its affection. And what's very important here is how we understand this word and what's literally said in the Greek language. Now, again, he's beginning with the man, but he's going to say the same thing to the woman. And we want to understand it literally because it's only in the literalness of the text that we see the truth of the revelation of Scripture. So he says, to a wife or a woman... <clears throat> 
a man shall render, let him render. And it has an expression, which is the word obligation. But the next word, and it's important because most, if you're not reading a translation that derives from the Texas Receptus, the other, Nestle Allen, I believe, just leaves it out altogether. And this is a word, and it's an important one. You can study it. It's the word eunoion. What is that? Well, it comes from a, a two words, literally. One's a prefix, the word you, meaning good. And the other one has to do with a mindset, a good mindset. So it's an obligation to think good. And here's the, the message here, that we think well in behalf of the other. Not thinking about our needs, our wants, ourselves, but we render to the wife what is good according to her thoughts, her needs, what is going to be beneficial. And Paul uses a word here that it's an obligation. So realize that. I want to say strongly to husbands, you need to realize that you have an obligation to think well, think in regard to what your wife needs and give it to her, to give from, and that's literally, I translated it rendered, but it's two Greek words, the word give and from, and this was implied to give of yourself. It can be thought of in a sacrificial manner. So Paul is emphasizing, he says, to the wife, the man, his uh, good thinking obligation, let him render, and here again, What's first in this phrase is to the woman. So let him render this, this obligation of thinking good, thinking well, thinking according to her needs, her desires, her wants. Let him render these things to her, to his wife. And then it says in the second half of verse 3, this word homios, which is likewise or similarly or in the same way, but similarly, also the wife to the husband, the woman to the man. So there's equality. Both should be thinking not of themselves, but of the needs of their spouse. Now, this is very important because he mentions this in dealing with marriage very early on. He puts this forth. That's important. So husbands and wives, we need to think of ourselves in a covenantal marriage with obligations. And those obligations are to your spouse that you think in light of what they want, what they need, what would be pleasing to them. And that you render it, that you give from, that is from yourself to them. So Paul is very clear in what he's saying here. Look on to verse 4. Here again, he's going to begin with the man, but he's going to say the same thing to a woman. As I was preparing for this, I just read the first half, and my youngest daughter heard that, and she says, well, that's not fair. Then I read the second half, and we had a discussion about what is the mindset that we should have. So once more, Verse, verse 4, he says, A woman, her own body, she does not have authority. So of her own body, she does not have authority. Now realize this is in context to what he's just said. And once more, we're not talking about being exploited, being abused. We're talking to people who want to fulfill God's purposes, who want to live a sanctified, that is a life according to the purposes of God, that manifests holiness, that is primarily has a desire to be pleasing to one's spouse. And what he says here, and he mentions the woman, her own body, she does not have authority and that's that word authority in a verb sense, but the man does. 
So the man has authority over the wife's body, and he says, but likewise, and this is even emphasized, but likewise also, the man, he has no authority over his body, but rather it's the woman, the wife. So what it's saying here is this, that I need to see myself as a vessel of service to my wife. In every aspect, and likewise, she needs to see that in a similar way. So there's a mutual thought that I'm here for her, she's there for me. It's not something that is problematic. It's something speaking about mutual surrender, mutual giving, mutual sacrifice for the joy, the pleasure, the, the good feelings of the spouse. So my mindset in a biblical covenantal marriage is not of myself, but rather it's for my spouse. And you need to be thinking, and it's difficult. It goes against our natural uh, self, our normal nature, but we're a new creation. And one of the ways that we grow spiritually is through this covenantal relationship known as a marriage. So constantly... When I am with my wife, I am thinking about her needs, her wants, her desires, and I want to render myself for those. Here again, we're talking about righteous, holy, good desires. Nothing that is, is humiliating, nothing that is offensive, nothing that is, is displeasing to God. That's the context that, of course, we have to read upon every passage of the Bible. So once again, very strong language, verse 4. The woman, her own body, she does not have authority, but it belongs to the man. Likewise also, the man does not have authority over his body, but rather, this belongs to the wife. And then he says something, verse 5. Now, verse 5, remember, I shared with you that uh, there is evidence that there was a, a vibrant Jewish congregation, community in Corinth. Why do we know that? Well, I've been to Corinth and I've seen the, the sign, a stone sign that was, was carved out, inscribed, where it speaks about the synagogue of the Hebrews. So we know, going back to Paul's time, there was a synagogue for Hebrews. And Paul had the, the customary way of going into a community and first and foremost going into the synagogue where there were both Jews and Gentiles who were known as God-fearers. And he would speak and address the message of the gospel. Why there first? Well, because this would have been the easiest place to communicate this message. Because they would have had the foundation of the Hebrew Bible. They would have been able to make a connection to what he was saying. These concepts wouldn't be foreign to them as, as much as it would be to uh, someone who did not come from a, a scriptural background. Synagogue, they studied the law and the prophets. Very important. Read the Psalms as praise and prayer to God. So Paul used scripture in doing this. So likewise, I want you to see when we come to verse 5, there is a, a biblical, scriptural context. Also culturally, they grew out of an understanding of the word of God. And that had to do with with a time within marriage because of what's known as nida. Now, nida, it's difficult to translate that word into English. It's a form of, of ceremonially being unclean based upon the, the monthly cycle of a woman. And at that time, according to the Torah, there is no sexual intimacy. They are set apart. Now, let me just share with you, there is a, a difference between Jewish cultural uh, uh, observance of this and what the scripture says. 
The scripture says that there is a seven-day separation. Judaism deals with the woman now in this time frame that we are, not as a nida, but in another category, which has to do with having a, a discharge outside the normal time of menstruation. And because of that, there were different laws. These are found in the scripture. And that is that there had to be a counting of pure days, days without any discharge. So seven clean days because something was going on abnormal. Well, Judaism today, under rabbinical law, not Torah law, but rabbinical law, says every woman who is a biblical would be classified as a nida. Well, they give them a different classification, zava, which has to do with something that would render the woman unclean in an additional sense, and therefore there is an additional seven days that must be seen as spotless. And the time of, of, of uncleanliness is usually during a normal needed time, five. Now, it's extended biblically to seven, but, but here we say five, so you have 12 days, five where there's a, a discharge, seven clean, 12, and then on the next day, one can come together. What is that to do? Well, it's to put the couple, when they come back together, it's to put them at the time when she is ovulating so conception will happen. Now here again, all of this is rabbinical. When we come now to, to, verse, to verse 5, what we should have is always a Torah basis. So when it says here, now let's look at the text, verse 5. And do not deprive one another. And the word deprive is to turn from. So he's speaking here, and this phrase is significant, although we render it deprive in English. It's turning from. And this relates to this time, biblically now, let's only talk about biblical truth, not rabbinical law, where because of menstruation, there was a separation between the man and the woman. And they used this time for prayer and fasting to renew because nida, this blood, blood is synonymous. We have here the reason why there was blood because the egg died. And that egg dying, not being fertilized, it symbolizes death. Death is related to sin. Blood can be seen also for redemption, but also blood relates to impurity, especially the shedding of blood out as an outcome of death. So here, the, because of Nida, there is a tendency, a tradition within the Jewish community to set aside when the woman was in this condition. It says here that they would be set aside. Notice what verse 5 says. Do not deprive one another. Do not turn from one another except for this certain uh, uh, purpose and there's an agreement it has here the word for voice and together so unanimously there is a concession concession there is a consensus consensus so there is a a mutual agreement uh, for and notice this it's emphasized here for a season so do not deprive one another except for this certain manner by a mutual concession that, uh, and for a season in order that uh, uh, for the, the sanctification. Now, it's a word here which means to, to set aside time for a purpose, for fasting and prayer, and then again for this same reason to come together. That same reason that he said it earlier, that we, we think of the needs of one another. 
So Paul is, is speaking here, although the congregation obviously would have non-Jews in it. But he's speaking because there should be one culture, a biblical culture. So look again. He says, verse 5. Do not deprive one another except for this certain thing by, by a mutual agreement for a season in order that you might be sanctified for fasting and prayer. And then again, for the same reason to come together. And he says, you come together. Why? End of the verse. In order that uh, Satan does not tempt you. On account of your, and he uses a phrase here, which means the, the lack of power. And in this case, it's self-control. So Paul is saying, because we're still in the flesh, we still have physical human needs. He says, this is what I'm telling everyone. This is normal. So it goes back, remember the question that it begins with. Is it good? Is it proper? For a man not to touch a woman. And Paul is saying here, by and large, no, it is not God's will. And we talked about why it's not God's will because of what the Torah says. Be fruitful and multiply. And secondly, let every man do what? Let every man not be alone. It's not good for a man to be alone, but to have a wife. So he's very clear. Now look at verse 6. But this I say on account of concession, not according to a commandment. Now, God here, through Paul, Paul is saying, God has not commanded me this in the sense that this, what he's saying is, is Paul not based upon a commandment, but based upon, obviously, the leadership and the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. When we look at the end of verse 6, we have this word meaning commandment. He's saying, this I say as a concession, in the same way that, that Moses permitted divorce under certain conditions. He allowed it. This is what Paul is doing here. He says, as you keep reading, look now to verse 7. He says, for I wish that every man to be as also myself. Now, what's he referring to here? Where Paul, he is not married, presumably. Perhaps he was. Perhaps his wife died. We do not know. But what Paul says here is, I wish rather, he says, fellow gar pantos anthropus. A nigh, which is for I wish all men to be as also myself. But notice what he's speaking about here. It's a unique situation. But each one has his own gift from God. So what Paul is saying here is that he has been given a gift. This is an exception that's, that's not found in the Torah. In the Torah, let every man, it's not good for him to be alone, let every man marry and let him be fruitful and multiply. That is Torah truth. But now, through the grace of God, and he uses a word here when he says gift, he says, look at verse 7. He says, charisma. Charisma is rooted in the word grace and it's a, a gift that comes from the grace of God. And Paul is saying that he has a gift. And that gift is not to need that relationship. And the purpose of that gift, it's very clear. The purpose of that gift is to, in a unique way, dedicate oneself to the purposes of God. Paul is traveling. Paul is, is committed and beyond a full-time commitment. And therefore, he knows how hard it is to do what he's doing if he also has the responsibility of a wife and a family. Remember what he talked about earlier, about a man should be thinking about 
the needs, the desires, what's good, what the wife needs. So this all takes part of one's life. So he says here, I have a gift and, and I do not need that, that, that same type of intimacy, this relationship with the spouse. And therefore, he says, I wish everyone was like me. But he says, each one according to his own gift from God. And then he speaks, look at the end of verse 7. He has a unique phrase, host men who tos, host de aftos. Uh, why is that important? Because we have this men day. Men day, these two words, they're separated by other words. But whenever we see them, it's talking about on one hand this and on another hand this. And he uses a word here twice. Let's look at it again where he says, Os men oftos, os de oftos. Oftos is the word here for thus. So on one hand, thusly, on another hand, thusly. So he's simply speaking about each person has their own gift. Gift always is for purpose. So he says each one has his own gift for this purpose and that purpose. Now all of them are the purposes of God. But God gives different gifts for different calling. And Paul says, you know, it's wonderful. I wish everyone had the same call to be fully set aside, separated from any type of, of human natural uh, uh, responsibility so that they can be fully dedicated to the work of, of the gospel. But he says not everyone has that gift and a gift is related to calling. And that's why he says, sometimes it's thusly and other times it's thusly. But Paul is rejoicing over this unique call that he has. Look now to verse 8. He says, but I say to the ones who are unmarried and also to widow widows. Now, this is important because in the weeks to come, we're going to be looking at this section as it goes forth. And he's going to be talking about uh, several different groups of people. Those who are unmarried, having never been married, virgins. He's going to be talking about unmarried, but those who are not virgins. Perhaps widows, those who have lost a spouse. Another possibility is divorce ones. And then also he's going to be talking about those who are married. And he's responding once again to questions, important questions that as believers we encounter, whether we're single, whether we're married, whether we're widows, whether we're divorced, whatever it might be, Paul's going to speak to. So this section is very important and practical. And he says, look at verse 8. We're going to wrap up in a moment. But I say to the unmarried and to the widows, good for them if they remained as also I. So Paul's saying for those who are unmarried, and it can be those who have never been married or those who are widows, both those are, are mentioned here. He says it's good for them if they should remain as I am. Meaning what? Paul's not married. It's good. Now, once again, you have to look at that in light of what he just said in the previous verse, which is if you have that gift. In fact, if you look here, he says this same word for good and good means in accordance with God's will. If it's God's will for them, that they should remain as I. If it is, they should follow it. But then again, he says, our last verse, verse 9. But on account of, really, lack of self-control. But if they do not have this self-control, let them what? Marry. Now, first of all, let us see this self-control is what? A gift from God. There are individuals that, that they don't have or they control this, this human need for intimacy 
where they don't need it or they do not have to, to allow it to be part of their life. And Paul says here, if you do, great. Use that for full-time dedicated service where you don't have the responsibilities of a spouse and a family. But if this is not the case, if you don't have that call, and let me tell you, as I don't have that call, and I've talked to people who do, and they are clear. It's not, well, I haven't gotten married yet, therefore I must have this call. No, you know it ahead of time. It is clear. It is something that you can feel within yourself. You, you have knowledge of it. So it's not a default call. It's one that, that is given to you clearly. So he says, but if you do not have this, this self-control, let them marry, for it's better, it is better for them to marry than what? And notice the last phrase he uses, to burn. And this means to burn, the context is to burn with a desire, to have that alive. And burning can sometimes mean destructive, to have it eating away at you. So Paul makes it very clear. If you don't have this call, if you don't have that gift, if you don't have that ability of self-control, all of those relate together. A call, a gift, self-controlled in this area. He says, let them marry. It is appropriate. They're not doing anything wrong. In fact, as we talked about, they are fulfilling what is the norm, what God has given to his people through the law, the commandments, or the Torah. That it's not good for man to be alone. That is the normal, unless they have this unique call. Well, we're going to close with that until next week, when we press on in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, learning more about this marital relationship, this important aspect of, of life between men and women within this biblical covenant known as marriage. Until then, shalom from Israel.